getting in synchrony with the rise fall, which is not exactly the same as being in step with it. This is kind of an important point. <coughs> When we're just in step with the guy's rise and fall, we're just holding hands in the water. Boom. We just had a dance. And we're just in If his foot falls and my foot falls after, I get to load it. His body gets weird. And you get this very strange effect. I'm, I'm in rhythm with him, but I'm out of step, so, so I'm hitting him. Um, and it could be any kind of connection. Yeah. When you when you get people turning around, you see the same kind of function. If we're rotating through space and we're going and we're staying in step together, everything's spinning together, it really uh, kind of cancels itself out. But he starts turning and I turn just after him. Huh. It overloads him to one side. And this points to something that I was just reading last, well, yesterday afternoon. Dealing with um, what they, what they, the Kito Ru people themselves described as the central element of what they were trying to do. It had to be, they described it as non-rhythm. So if you got a guy walking like this, you want to do something in your feet that is going to take you out of that very regular thing. People's bodies moving through space habituate and entrain to da -da, da -da, da -da. goes up over the top, rises, falls in the valley, goes up over the top, falls, rises in the valley, and it establishes a rhythmic quality very quickly. And if we are unconscious with it, hey Derek, we will tend to entrain directly to that. And there are times and places where it's a really bright idea so that you can get very finesseful. You say you're doing a release. You say, touch the foot, touch the foot, touch the foot. And because I've operated around him in asymmetrical ways, touching the foot at the same time has served me okay. But it actually gets far worse to him if I know when his foot's about to touch him. Touch the foot just after, touch the foot just after. Now he's not getting a little more violently, <laughs> right? He's actually having to eat two problems, which is one, I'm getting in the sink with him. The rise and fall are happening together, but my sink is happening just after this, which has to do with exploiting the drop. We're going to get into that today some more. So um, now I've just babbled a bunch, and I don't know what we were talking about. What were we talking about? Young cut. Rise and fall in young cut. Um, Yeah, so is, it, is there more on Yankai? Mm. I just kind of wanted to know where it fell into why we did it to make his part of the speaking line and support. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, well, and it has kind of makes sense that it became this really strong emphasis with grappling because the whole kata is about people grabbing a hold of you. Right. It has a really strong emphasis on working from static to dynamic. It has a really strong emphasis on this flow of rise and fall. So you see people with ukes that are very dedicated to dropping and being very powerful and monstrous. And you see elements of how to respond to that by getting way down here to do that. But when you look at the old days and you watch uh, higher level people, oh, you watch the old film and whatnot, yeah, it was less about just really just a plan coming down on your wrist like a ton of bricks. And it was far more about just catching, interrupting his, his action of drop. So provoking a rise out of this, dropping the yeah. and then controlling from there. So over time, you'll find a, a wide range. And by uh, the late late 90s, I seem to recall watching a video of a very high-level Japanese instructor complaining that, well, in the old days, Mr. Tomiki could do this and just do it really light and just dance around the Tomiki. But nobody can do that anymore. And I thought, huh, that's weird. We've been doing that like a dream. Hey, you're going to see it. Since, you know, since 1980 in Oklahoma, I don't know what's going on in Japan. But, and I didn't understand it at the time. Then I watched more closely in the ukes they're producing were built around uh, a competitive model of delivery of energy. 
And so when you build an UK as competitor instead of an UK as receiver of energy, you wind up distorting what Tories have it to do to accomplish something like what the throw is supposed to look like. And whatever kind of UK you create will reform the kind of Tory you wind up with. And obviously in the older days, there were UKs that were more classically oriented around delivering energy, receiving energy. And later, that starts to get distorted as sports do to all martial arts, in my thesis, that you start seeing conformity to a different set of rules, conformity to a different objective, which is not wrong, but it does start having an effect until at that point in the late 90s, here's this great master going, I don't know why we can't make it happen like he did. Because he's living in a different world. He's created a different world around him. And literally those people that were attacking like that don't exist anymore in his world. So of course he can't do it. But it's not that he can't do it, it's that he can't do it with these guys trained the way he's trained them to be. You know what I mean? And so being really clear about what our objectives are as Luke Victoria can be very helpful for that sort of thing. Anyway. How are you, Amanda? For those of you right in, this is called Koshiki no Kata. It comes from Kipa Rukijutsu. It's foundational to Judo. But then it becomes foundational to Kumiki's ideas of the importance of our ego. And so it's one of the main two branches of Koru that influence um, the technical curriculum that we do. Um, and it's, it's probably when you compare what we do to the rest of Aikido out there in the world that you run into online and look at YouTube and visiting schools and whatnot, reading books. There's a whole bunch of stuff where we have temptations to go, God, they're good at it. Why don't they get their hand inside? Why don't they go to the What's wrong with these people? There's a lot of it that we can get very dismissive of very quickly because they are coming at it from a very much more slanted one side of those two branches of the code tree building their Aikido out of it. So most Aikido in the world is really built almost entirely out of Daikil ideas with a little bit of stuff around the edges. Too. And Tomiki's is much more of a hybrid form. And so we get inculcated in a set of technical ideas that just become unconscious to us. And this is where a lot of those ideas come So that's, anyway, that's why we're bothering this. Cool? Yeah. And it's as if we're in our
and your uh, friends are teaching you can come up with one. Um, but there is no end point. And yeah, constant refinement. So, you know, you take your performance today and say, oh, well, compared to these 30 of the chimney. In the old days, you couldn't find one, did you? Okay. And finally, you get one from the company, and wow, you finally get to see this thing that you only read about. And then it explodes, and now you can watch 50 different ones. You know? All sorts of stuff out there. And you see a wide range. You say, well, how does Andres go up against that wide range? But it's still only about 50 of them, you know, compared to how many people you see putting out. Not even a Not even a Right. Most of which are pretty bad also. So you have this, this <laughs> fair and narrow range of which you would have to be a member in that, in that, in that ballpark. And I would put you ahead of some of them, behind some of them. Generally, yeah, you're at least showing up. <laughs> and that's pretty rare. That's pretty rare in and of itself. I, I saw less hesitation on this. Yeah, he was more on point, wasn't he? Yeah. And it's hard to get up and do this in front of people. Right? We just do it by ourselves and we're like blathering through it, but we have to actually perform it. People are watching. Hold it. Uh, I have a question. Sure. The, the last part where you're doing a lot of these sacrifice those things, there's just no hesitation. You're doing one technique and going right in. Right. The, the last piece is as if the armor has been broken and fallen off. That's how she gets going. She she says, oh, your, your armor broke. It's all in pieces. And now you're just running around in your under armor. You're in your armor all. You're in your underwear. And there's no, the plotting thing is gone. And there's no hesitation, there's no pause between things so much. Okay, right. And it's, you just come right into engagement and go from there, right off the bat. So it does have a whole different character. And it was the part that was formulated some number of years, probably 100, 150 years after the original set was promulgated. About how long, how long ago you said the word this was? This, this started to arise around the 1600s. I would put the second piece the oral laws are probably coming in at like 17 early 1800s. That's a long time. Yeah. So it existed just as that first chunk, along with some, I'm sure, plenty of Funga, ideas of variation around that. But it didn't coalesce into this full 21 piece thing until a while later, until another fella came along and went, huh, I wonder if I took these ideas and do it like this, what that would be like. And, and that was good enough to be yeah, kept over the long haul. Are all of the attacks uh, considered to be unarmed attacks, or some of those? Uh, yeah, the one where I walk out like this, I've got a knife behind my back. And it's actually kind of instructive to do that one with a knife behind your back. If you're reaching in, his hand arm is rising to get a hold of him. My objective of attack would be, hey, look over there. And I grab him here. <laughs> Right. So this arm is rising up, and he's ready to come out, and he's got to deal with the fact that he can't come into this zone because the spear is coming again. Are some of the lower abdomen strikes, or they grab That could be bell. considered strikes. They could be considered attempts to come in and grapple with the open. Okay. They could be considered ways to get a hold of the control. They can also be considered, I'm going for his weapons. Right. That I'm going to disarm him. I've lost my weapon, I'm going to go take it away. So there's implication from all that. Most of the attacking is some form of getting a hold of his center very directly and then trying to look up to it. Because it puts him conveniently at my feet where I can then fall on him and kill him to death. So again, battlefield oriented tactics. And really the expression of the big falls, too. I mean, it would be far easier um, with the steady one than if he did a nice, pleasant, just sit down, roll back thing. But that doesn't do the complete smiting. <laughs> you know? It's, it's an easier job as Uke. It's very preferential as Uke goes. So, yeah, please, just go ahead and sit down. Yeah, yeah, he squats down, and he sits down, and he gently rolls over. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But it's not the complete transmission of energy. It's not the full range of motion. It's not doing a complete job of breaking the rhythm so abruptly. 
the slams me down the bottom. It was really extraordinary. Projecting fall. And when somebody knows you're peeing, you survive that, you come up, you're going to check. That was a tough one. But, you know, it doesn't kill you. Somebody doesn't have that particular skill set, you're going headlong into the world. And in fact, there's a, there's a famous incident with one of my favorite Kito teachers, Kevin Kato. I think it's called Kato, just because of Korean blood and all that, but it's Kato. <laughs> and Kato ran a school in the early 1800s, like I said. And at one point, this big burly jitsu fellow from the place shows up. Comes in, I'm here to train, and he trains for a while. And he, he trains for a few weeks, maybe a month, before he just can't stand it. He's got to get a piece of this old guy and see what it's really about to prove that he's really the bad one. And sure enough, Kato accepts the challenge. And as soon as the man lays hands on him, he's thrown head first into the stream. And it's got to be. <laughs> it's got to be that, you know? You, I can just visualize it. Because, yeah, the guy, this big, burly monster guy, runs headlong into the wall, his head goes through the wall, and protrudes out into the avenue <laughs> from the baseboard out. And when he shakes it off, it, gets up, it becomes a humble student. But it's <laughs> and it's like, how did this little fella do this monster thing to me? He couldn't get his kid counterintuitive. He could not understand it. And probably because it's hard to force yourself isometrically to fall over back in that way. In fact, I have a hard time doing it at all if I'm not hooked or something. You can put a blue pad down and kind of do like a log fall. Oh, because yeah, I got the extra padding and you can be confident you're not going to bang the back of your head. But if you don't have the counterweight out here and you try to just go, your reflexes are trying to save you. And they're smart. <laughs> They're saying something important there, which is, hey, you'd rather hit your butt than hit your head. And so, yeah, the reflex to do this is very really strong. And it should be there. But you have to overcome that in terms of connecting with another body and really project the power in order to throw the guy's head through the wall. And your unbendable arm keeps him from landing on you? And it's not the unbendable arm. It's the, it's the body's falling. Yeah. You, 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 okay. Excuse me. So I've projected him back, and he's stopped me. And I'm just hooking him up. I'm just going to make arms like this. My, arm, my elbows are loose. And the transmission goes to the arm, but it's, it's not particularly pushy. It's more like just tracking through. Cool. The arms are straight at a certain point in the fall because your weight has pulled them straight. Yeah. It makes it yeah. straight. He can be all crumpled up like this, and by the time he starts going, they come out. And people, oh, you pushed him off. No, you're not pushing. You're just allowing the transfer of your body weight to go. Cool. Yeah, it would probably be incorrect if you did try to pull him to you, because if you're focused on this, I suspect you wind suck. up pulling him on top of you. And you see this a lot with judo people that do Satemi Waza poorly. Is they do them as an expression of, I'm going to throw you right now, right here. I've got my cool thing. I'm going to pull you in and throw you. And what happens often, Andre? You go to a lot of judo tournaments? Mm -hmm. uh, usually, you either throw the person directly on top of you, right. or you throw yourself and they stand there and look at we'll you. Look at you. And, and then, then jump on jump top on of you. Jump on you. Crush you. Like, so, so, yeah. That happens a lot. That's mm -hmm. been my experience, too, watching it. And I think it has a lot to do with when they're doing it. And how they're doing it. That's right. Are they, are they taking it off with this change in rhythm? Or are they going when they decide it's time to go? Because most of modern competitive judo things are based around like I'm a sniper. And I'm waiting for you to take that step and bam, I shoot you. And it's not based around that we're just dancing together and I'm watching for that comfortable. But at first I got in step with it. But they do it this way. <laughs> Very different. I didn't actually have to fall for that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I'm looking at that. And I just jump out there like I'm, I'm just taking a shot at it. Versus I like, create a relationship. We split the relationship when we're both going to rise. Very different. So Timmy goes the same way. You create the relationship, you move through that relationship. You get in that synchrony. 
and then you break the synchrony at a particular moment. Did you that technique developed from this? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. The, the judo curriculum developed out of this and another jiu-jitsu group called Kishi Shinjo. Mm -hmm. Which didn't make its way into Aikido so much. No. no. Kito Ru is where we get Kizushi. It's where we get the fable about, oh, you grab Mr. Kano and it's an empty gate. You can't feel it. That kind of sensitivity, that kind of lightness. More gentle. Because Kito Ru is where we get the concept of doing wrong door. Rather than just be a kata based oriented transmission of how to kill each other through kata, we have this whole wrong door thing where we really kind of put it on and try it out on each other, you know, not killing each other, but really trying to kill each other kind of way, which is holding contradictory ideas. Um, and a whole slew of other disciplines. Um, those are pretty major. <laughs> Those are very normal to our thinking about Aikido and Judo, but they really derive to us from that historical principle. Which isn't to say that Daito didn't evolve a similar body of things. It evolved the same kind of lightness, but it just got there in a completely different way. Daito got there also coming at the whole aspect of what kind of conflict you're imagining as being more of a, a, a knife and a fist fight. We're in some sort of striking engagement. There's going to be some elbows and knees and hips. And there's going to be a knife in there somewhere, or a short sword, or a stick. <laughs> something, to, something to really haul off the mind again. That there was, there was a presumption in the Daito concept that it all had to be about some sort of striking art thing that would be within. And in the Kito concept, um, yeah, it's almost entirely great. We're getting a hold of each other. We're getting a hold of each other and doing it fairly sophisticated thing with regard to that as a Anyhow, I'm blabbering on too long. We haven't done a damn thing. We should start moving, huh? Okay, so day one, we did things in which we encountered a guy, and what do we do from here? So we come, say what? Body ride come up. We make body rides, stepping behind our own leg. You go from standing, where in the world, to standing on a tightrope. You put one knee behind the other one. And when you have contact with him, and you do that, you can do the same. So, what happened to that? That's kind of what do we do then? Where do we go from there? Because it's always transiting in this sort of shape, 
and it's just an R. Now we're saying, let's do it. Let's take our whole body's momentum and move it through space like that. Let's see what happens. Right? Day one. Also on day one, oh, the other variable, rather than, rather than the things that maybe go in the body this way, there is also things that maybe go in the body like twisted. This is when the body turns to the space. Like this, it's right. There is a turning action that happens in the body. It's not right, but it's all hips. Here. But walking and turning at the same time. Is there anything else in day one? Oh yeah, we applied these ideas to Gabe not to got to come out to the Shiro up We talked about a range of motion starting from the eyeballs down through the body. We talked about the reaching in the pocket over here and how that's different than pushing through. And how that also translates to the wrap the fun with your grappling with your sympathetic down list. And you get in here and you're making whatever you can. You can go all the way down as low as you want to a squat. The Kiko Kaka itself, the Koshiki Kaka, stops about at the belt line with that regional answer. But you do see evidence sometimes of people being extraordinary going all the way to the ground. Cool. And what did we do yesterday? Oh, yeah. Yesterday was the, uh, the spin by the shoulders stuff. The yeah. rise of the yeah. Yeah. So the spin by the shoulders means that we have like a, an element where someone is turning, someone is violently spinning us around, causing us to rotate in space, therefore exploiting our body mind. And how we want to react to that, if we don't react, we just wind up getting overwhelmed. So I'm turning, he's turning. Woo! Go he goes flying off into space. But if I'm going woo and then he goes off in a straight line. Woo, yes. Ow. I get a new ride. <laughs> so it had to do with if you took a like a cylinder, saw a marble around inside of it, got it going. And you opened up a cork on the side of the cylinder. And that marble came around and hit that hole. It picked that acceleration that's going around and around, translated into this. Or in example, you have a hammer, you do a hammer throw. And we're spinning our whole body to accelerate that hammer. But at the point of release, that hammer is ready to go flying out. And if you did that and you had a rope on the hammer to your shoulder, yeah. it would throw you. Yeah, yeah. it would throw that into the space and hit the end of the line with a slap. And it would knock the head out of the Or rip your arm off. Or rip your arm. Whatever. And we talked about that in terms of tension compression. And how we normally think he's got an overwhelming thing on his arm, and we can create tension by relaxing the structure here, like a rope, stepping straight back, and how that popped him up. But how, in some circumstances where he's already braced and he's coming at you, it's probably a bad idea to take a big step back because he's just going to overwhelm that big step. And we know from Ron Dory, two or three steps back, one, two regular steps, by step three, if they're really on your ass, you're doomed. Doom, but uh, fail with that. Even the gods do not say the doom. Third step in a normal reaction going straight back, usually all she wrote. Athletically unsurvivable. Typically. High probability of doom. Not always, but often. Almost certain. But, almost certain. But he's coming at me, or I'm coming at him. I'm a big overwhelming force. <clears throat> and he opts to take little tiny funny steps. Yeah, breaking rhythm, taking it out of my rhythm. If he tries to go in my rhythm, yeah, step on his feet. Easy, easy pivot. I start doing the same job, and he latches on lightning and makes those little funny steps. Whoa! Rush. And my whole activity, <clears throat> Mongo kill. Starts running into this weird little cycling problem. And anywhere in there, you can say, oh, I think pull that. Or fall back for the big thing. It's a cottage that's a fun thing. I'm going to subject you all to it.
see this, but we don't have to do it all in one direction. People flying that violently, you can go to Ukraine. Anything else for me? No? Okay. So, the third major element of throwing that occurs in this topic is readily identifiable. In a judo sense, he's reaching up to get me, and I do this. It's just uki otoshi. And that's sort of glomming him down for him. Maybe more precise, he's really pushing. Just like that. And in the koshiki no kata, it happens on this fry. So it's Okay, either one. Right, this is coming up. Yeah. And all three forms are useful for illustrating different moments in understanding what we think of as some form of Yotoshi. Yotoshi action comes out of this compass space. Uh, there are variants in it, though, when you've seen Forms. The first form has to do with attacking the other. We think often of attacking this elbow as some form of provoking rise up through here. Is that familiar to you guys? Certainly. Or this sort of thing, the vaulting thing. We, hey, fun, huh? And so it becomes a very linear in the vertical, or not a vertical dimension, basically. These all still exhibit quite a quality of dropping down in a way. So it's less that tight encounter and more the extension encounter. And I think that's largely because Andre has a damn knife in his other hand. And if I'm going to get a hold of this and start trying to make this go, I'm still stabbed. Right? So rather than that, it's actually taking place at a greater range and hitting from sideways. It's hitting him off this run. And if he's coming in that body runs, so this is way underneath. So we can get a knife if you like. But if you just treat the knife like the other hand like it has a knife, it'll probably be sufficient. The first element here is just that. It's just that we're reacting to this arm coming up. We want to match it. We're walking towards it. He's walking towards us. We're just challenging by itself. You may want to just start stabbing. This rising thing happens, and I adjust to it on the fly. So this is the first little goodie. See, it caught up a little, floating him up. I want to pop him up on his body rise. Since he's doing the activity of lifting, we'd like to do the activity of lifting too. And we'd like to do it. On the fly and in motion. Because for a moment, his body gets very busy. Even with that. While his body is very busy, we said body rise, we go sideways to it. We reach out, we touch it 90 degrees if we can. So this thing often looks like thank you. Yeah. Right. It doesn't have to be impactful. Think about creating this line of force and doing something square to it. That will be sufficient. As that's happening, we're doing, again, multiple things to it, right? Up, sideways, then the drop happens. Because if I go straight to the drop, in this case, the knife comes out and... Cool? Any questions? You're reaching for me. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Nothing? I have one yeah, please. Um, for those who were here a couple summers ago, mm -hmm. when you did the judo taiso, it was the first technique, and yeah. it was very much like that, wearing it into the hole. Right. Um, that's, I just noticed that was very similar, just with one hand instead of two. Right. Mm -hmm. That's a good observation. I like that observation. Or it kind of puts it jalapenos. It's like if the jalapenos lure you in, like they're not so hot, then all of a sudden you're like, oh, wow, why did I eat that? <laughs> <laughs> hmm? Yeah, we want something that's yeah. a surprise. <laughs> exactly. Very good, thank you. Well, Tomiki, when he first created this thing that we think of each, these, uh, 
You know, Danny, you know, if he's one of his pain doesn't hurt, it's dysfunction. Damn thing won't work. <laughs> doesn't mind it hurts. If somebody just tore your arm, well, oh, that's just something. You know. <laughs> that's just a feeling. The fact that it don't do right, that is the thing. So anyway, yeah, we, we proved pretty quickly that, yeah, you can be a single armed individual and compensate and do it all. It becomes more Daito esque. Because Daito does exhibit a lot of point of control within a given half step, straight to the ground, with one contact, not multiple contacts. It's a differentiation that's easy to pick out. When you see Aikido being applied as one hand up here doing close stuff, you can always find probably more of that into the spectrum. And if everything's the center, you see your hands are operating, your feet are moving around, you can say, oh, that's going over to this end. And, and all Aikido does some of both. Ueshiba himself did keep the rule. But it was not nearly as influential in the overall arc of the thinking that he was putting together as it was with Tomiki. Because Tomiki had already come up and become very highly ranked in judo. He was a highly respected judo dude by the time that he wound up studying with Ueshiba. And that, that uh, blending of those two lines of thought really different kind of thing. When I look at Ueshiba's work, a lot of what he spent time on looking at judo had to do with ways of dealing with judo players. How the hell do we deal with these guys that just come in and grab them and how do we do with that? So he had to come up with large amounts of strategy to deal with all these guys that are swinging swords and the guys that are coming in and just grapple with them, sumo with the guys. And he built bodies of techniques or was it to get in because he was doing all, you know, Challenge all coming, right? He was, <laughs> he was standing up saying, I'm the ultimate martial artist of my age. And all taking on all comers. Anybody want to come? Try it on? He did that. He did that. Before <coughs> and smoked people for years. So he had done a bit of research looking at grappling and looking at sword and looking at this, that, and the other, and he had taken the Daiko as the central basis, but he had also adapted things from other places. To, to build that mechanism that he's going to become really famous. And later got labeled Aikido by a committee somewhere. So he was calling it Aikido. Originally he was calling it Aikido. Then he called it Aikido. And then the war people were taking over Japan and decided they wanted to sort of oversee it. And they formed a the committee and they came up with the term Aikido actually. By this time he's saying, I'm going to go farm. I'm out of here. Because I'm going to be able to take this thing and go farm. We got out of town. And his son, who was a book keeper, said, well, Dad, we got this cool thing. We're calling it Aikido now. Maybe we can do something with it. Post-war, we start selling it. It becomes a big thing. And it takes on a sort of different character, too, at that point. Because the old man is out in the woods. And he comes to town once a month. He's traveling around from dojo to dojo. And he's just sort of dropping in and doing shit with people. And I'm going, whoa, that's amazing. And then they're doing the regular practice. The son is then propagating. It's arguable that at that point, Aikido really started shifting to a different paradigm itself, based around what was being marketed by Isamura. Isamura? Isamura. Isamura. My Japanese sucks. I'm an Oki. <laughs> I learned my Japanese from Texans. <laughs> Doesn't get any better. Yeah. We've had Japanese exchange students, and we use our Japanese that we learn, huh? and they literally don't understand anything we're saying except mate. <laughs> they get mate, mate right. stuff. They get mate. mate. They go, oh, no, we know that. Everything else sounds like OP Texan and Yeah. It's like we could count you know, each and each. <laughs> I don't know if Arkansas and Japanese is any better, but anyway. I know what the effect of OP is. <laughs> I don't pretend that it's stupid. Um, well, um, so yeah, we had this big shift with, with uh, the sun. And to me, I think you see a very similar set of things going on. I mean, his ideas coming into it and we start dealing with the time and situation and circumstances of dealing with working with those time and circumstances. And then that taking on a life of its own going off into Shiite. And if you're a Shiite guy, how I you love it. 
It ain't my hair at all. I don't think about it. I think about the stuff coming from the 50s with the Toshiron work before it really evolved towards Tanto Shia. The Tosha Rondori is, is kind of where I live, where I'm functioning around. Because I feel that it has a, a high degree of efficacy in the ladies of my judo, as well as my judo, as well as self defense. And when I start focusing on it as a game, whatever kind of game you're trying to do, you start narrowing the focus toward rules that are taking us away from what's going to happen when I'm walking out the door of the bar and the guy's swinging your bar. I really, really want to win then. I don't really give a shit about winning in here too much. I'd rather get all my losing done in here. <laughs> so that when the bar scene is happening and the bottle's falling on my head, that my bikini still is such like, whoa, shit, and I could come out of that. Boom. Throw him on his head right there. I like that subconscious instantaneous reflexive thing. And I found that Toshi Rondori does that for me more efficiently than if it narrows down into this point fight. The point fighting, whether it's a karate point fighting or a taekwondo point fighting or a judo point fighting, takes me away from the skill set that gives me higher survival probability than the real duress. And as long as the conflict is happening as, hey, you're looking at me? You're looking at me! And we get into shoving match and this is whole, we're both engaged and know that we're in a damn fight. All the Tory side of things and all the cool stuff you learn as a competitive thing will still serve you really well. But at the point that it's not you're looking at me, it's not the essential we're about to get in that fight. But it's actually that I'm just opening my car door and stepping out and licking my ice cream cone, and the brick is hitting me in the head. And that's the first time I know I'm in a damn fight, is the brick is hitting me in the head. But that, surviving from that circumstance, is not Tory related. It's related to skill sets building out of UK. And UK skill sets building out of receiving energy and transmuting it into good posture and balance and sending it back at them. And that's a whole different thing. And the competitive UK thing doesn't build the right deal. Because it's all premised on, hey, we don't worry about it. To deal with the real off balance and surprise and recovery from off balance and surprise, you have to build it from UK up. And that's the real difference I see in the line of thinking in the field of the But hey, I have gone way off the path. Sorry. I'm glad it's time for lunch. We come back at three.